Hello, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining the 17th webinar in our Pandemics and Society series. Today's webinar topic is From Outbreak to Containment, Marburg Virus. Today, we will be discussing the current status of the Marburg outbreak in Rwanda. I'll now pass it to our moderator, Wilmot James, Senior Advisor to the Brown Pandemic Center and Professor of the Practice of Health Services, Policy, and practice at the Brown University School of Public Health. Wilmot? Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, colleagues, uh, and welcome to our webinar um, on a Marburg virus disease, um, a rare yet highly lethal illness that poses significant public health challenges. My name is Walmart James, and I am a uh, senior advisor to the Brown Pandemic Center and a professor uh, at the School of Public Health here. So as you would know, uh, Marburg virus is closely related to Ebola. It is primarily transmitted through close contact uh, with Rosetta's bats, commonly found in caves and mines. Uh, in humans, it spreads through direct contact with infected bodily fluids or contaminated surfaces, leading to severe hemorrhagic fever with a staggering fatality rate of up to the upper 80s uh, into the early 90s. On September 27th uh, of this year, Rwanda's Ministry of Health confirmed the country's first Marburg outbreak following exposure linked to a mining cave. And in response to this outbreak, Rwanda has initiated novel clinical trials, launching the world's first trial of Marburg treatment, testing the antiviral remdesivir and the MBP091 antibody. The Sabin Vaccine Institute is also actively working to provide a Marburg vaccine and recently sending additional doses to protect at-risk populations, including uh, healthcare workers. Rwanda's robust response to the outbreak has garnered praise from the WHO. Their swift actions have resulted in a lower fatality rate of 24%, which might even be lower depending on when you start counting, a significant reduction compared to the typical rate seen in Marburg virus cases. With a total of 66 confirmed cases and ongoing efforts to monitor and treat those effective, uh, affected, Rwanda is making commendable progress uh, toward containing this outbreak. Today, we will explore the implications of this outbreak, the clinical trials currently underway, and the strategies Rwanda is employing to manage and mitigate the risks associated uh, with Marburg virus disease, joined by three experts in the field. First joining us today is Dr. Issa Makumbi, uh, the Deputy Director at Uganda's uh, National Institute of Public Health, and the Director of the Public Health Emergency Operating Center. Dr. Kumbi is a seasoned public health professional with a wealth of experience in managing health emergencies and outbreak responses. His leadership has been instrumental in coordinating national efforts during health crises, ensuring effective preparedness and response strategies. Colleagues to say that I will introduce our other two guests when it comes to their turn to speak. Uh, so firstly, uh, welcome, Issa. Uh, we're very pleased that you joined us uh, from Uganda uh, this, um, this morning, this afternoon, this evening. Thank you, Prof. Prof. Um, uh, today, I just want to really paint a picture on, on, on East Africa. And I have a slide which I want to share with everybody uh, that this is, not, uh, uh, this is not a new disease in the region. First of all, uh, I want to tell you that um, uh, in the regional context of East African community, which has seven countries, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, South Sudan, DRC, uh, and, uh, and uh, Burundi. So these are countries in East African community. This is the regional block, economic block. And uh, 
we 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 are working together as a block uh, and we want eventually to to eventually to be a, a federation however we have a treaty the east african community treaty which established the community uh, but it sets out that for countries in the region or in east african that we should jointly implement disease uh, prevention and control actions that benefit the population of east africa and I've told you that the East African uh, countries are, uh, are seven. Uh, so this disease, uh, actually, we first experienced it in Kenya, uh, 1987, and uh, fatality was 50%, uh, 50%. DRC, 1998, and then a series of outbreaks for Uganda, 2007, 2008, 2012, 2014, 2017, and then recently, or before recently, 2013 in Tanzania, very near Uganda, Kagera, Kagera region. And of course, now we shall, we are, shall be talking about Rwanda, which is a part of East Africa. So for us, really, we are um, advocating for a regional approach for this disease, uh, these, especially these uh, zoonotic diseases, because uh, our region shares a lot in common in terms of vegetation, in terms of culture, in terms of uh, uh, our, our population movement. So really that's why we, we are really sharing this. So, but the disease as uh, Prof has said, uh, it's very uh, fatal. It can, can go as far as 98 or 88% fatality. Um, so uh, we in, in East Africa, uh, we have uh, developed in order to make sure that we control and uh, we have developed a prevention and preparedness plans, including pandemic plans. We have an integrated East African disease uh, surveillance. We have a strategy for border border health. We have a strategy for one health strat for one strat one health strategy. And by the way, uh, uh, as I told you, I'm uh, up country. We have just finished uh, prioritizing our uh, zoonotic diseases of one health, and Marburg is very high on the list. We have also um, also building capacity together as a region. And what is very interesting, which I like, is that our neighborhood is very good. Whenever each of these countries is attacked, we all support each other to respond together. And, and, and in all those outbreaks uh, in, which happen in Uganda, all member states, Tanzania, you know, Rwanda, they come and support us to, to respond. And, and, you know, because as, as you know, an outbreak in Uganda is an outbreak in Kenya. So really, uh, that's why we really work together. And uh, and 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 for Rwanda, the current one, uh, we sent there two senior, uh, you know, specialists for Babag, uh, and they are already there, also working with the uh, Rwandan team, and we are very happy with the results, as you know. And so uh, we are working together. Uh, we we develop policies for the for the for the region, uh, which starts with the technical technical group discussing issues, which is sent to the senior group, which include permanent secretaries, directors, and these uh, go to the honourable ministers, and eventually the honourable ministers take this to the East African Parliament, and this becomes uh, either policy for all member states to really uh, uh, to operationalize such policy, which has been uh, muted by, by the East African parliament. So really for us in the region, uh, we are really very, very solid in one block that if anything happened to any member state, we are there to really to support each other. And uh, of course we share a lot of knowledge we share a lot of experience. We share a lot of tools. 
Uh, we may have tools for, for go data. We may have tools for surveillance. We have tools for, uh, you know, contact tracing. So really, we don't, there's no reinventing the wheel. If you, the tool is there and is working, we just apply that tool. And of course, we work with the partners. We work with the partners and, you know, where pass, give us more technical support and also give us, uh, you know, uh, uh, financial support. So really, this is the picture I want to 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 to, uh, to to put to you. But I want to emphasize that regional approach works and regional approach is the way to go for this. So that because the epi epidemiological area or geographical area, which is covered, is wide enough for you really to control these diseases. And uh, this is a hot spot, uh, a hot spot, East Africa for, for, for Marburg. And by the way, I think Marburg is really in the same triangle as Ebola. Because one time for when we had a, uh, uh, this, we had also it somewhere in, in West Africa. So really this is something which is in the triangle of, of Ebola. So I think I'll stop here but I've painted that picture of regional approach, which to me is the best practice. I thank you. So thank you very much uh, to Dr. Makumi for sketching out the East Africa's approach to uh, pandemic uh, preparedness uh, and response. Just to say uh, that this is against the context of Africa having the Africa Center for Disease Control, which is a continental technical support agency. Uh, for all of the member states, uh, and the Africa CDC is divided into five regions, including the East Africa region, of which Kenya is essentially the headquarters. Uh, and of course, the WHO um, is a global organization providing technical support as well. So those are the cascades in terms of support from global uh, to regional. If I can now introduce um, Dr. Janine Yu Kondo. Um, today, she's an adjunct associate professor of the public health of public health at the University of Rwanda and at uh, Tulane University in the U.S. She's a chief executive officer uh, for the Center uh, for Impact Innovation and Capacity Building for Health Information Nutrition, and to note that she's the former director general of the Rwandan uh, Biomedical. Uh, research institute. So uh, welcome, uh, Janine, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Wilma, James, and I'm very, very honored to be here to share our insight in terms of uh, Marburg. As you know, on September 27, uh, Rwanda declared the first case of Marburg. And at first we didn't know, you know, we were not prepared uh, enough. We thought it was malaria. We did all sort of uh, testing and so forth, but only after two second, third day that we started really looking into it. Um, as you know, Marba virus is, is a virus that is very, very highly violent and it kills quickly and devastates quickly. So we lost healthcare providers during those first days. Marba virus is similar to Ebola, as uh, Professor Dem said, it is in the same family of virus and the same type of signs, you know, someone with marble will present like someone with uh, severe malaria, with different um, symptoms that are could be confusing, right? So you start by headache, fever, and, and, and some malaise, severe diarrhea, as well as abdominal pain. As you move forward, you have uh, the typical case of marble. So I'll just stop here and see if we have other questions, but uh, just to say that Rwanda, uh, it's six, uh, 50 responses went from science to coordination and to, to respond based on the evidence-based. Uh, we have one slide. don't know if this is the right sign. As you can tell, uh, the blue lines are daily new cases. So this is our daily reports that the minister will send every day, communicating to the population, communicating to the science, what are, what are we doing? Where are we in terms of uh, Marburg? So this graph was driven from um, the daily report. So if you can see here, the first days of 27th of September, we have the daily cases that are very huge, you know, up to 20, 
five plus uh, cases, and then it went down. And if you look at mortality rate uh, per day, and see that you know we had that where we lost uh, most of our patients, and then it went down to almost zero today. I think we are the um, past day is six seven. So on these ones, um, the, that was the first time that we got Marburg. We lost uh, our healthcare providers, but eventually, with all the swift responses that we were going to talk about, at some point we're able to curb even to reduce um, to zero cases per day and zero death. James, um, I was wondering if I could go on and uh, talk a little bit about the paper that we published. Uh, that is actually how lining, uh, what needs to be done? I, I guess those are the questions for everyone here. What was that in Rwanda? I think all the ingredients need to be put in place. We saw it in COVID. We are still seeing it today uh, during my world. Number one is leadership. You need to have a very good leadership, very good coordinated effort, and very good uh, multilateral and, and bilateral and also national responses. On those seven steps that we talk about is to have that quickly rapid response team that is available, that is knowledgeable, that is happy to meet together and discuss quickly using the evidence base. Number two, I think uh, that people are asking themselves, how do, were you able even to put a trial quickly in a few seconds? And that's where you go to uh, activating your national regulators where that should be contacted. So here I'm looking at FDA, I'm looking at RB, I'm looking at all the national regulators to be quickly activated and, and be put in place to support the initiative. And number three, we talk about the infrastructure that should support the science such as the treatment center, the trials platform, and anything that will inform the community, patient community, as well as the community of people who are affected by the disease, as well as the scientists around them. And then number four is, uh, number five is to look for fund logistics support that was needed quickly. And that thanks to different efforts, as uh, USA said, but the USA regional support, multilateral support, and then, of, of course, lastly, to put at the scientific journals, I think all journals were, 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 were activated to receive anything that can come out to run and to support the response team. Um, so, James, I'll stop here if, uh, and, and happy to respond to any such a question. So, um, uh, many thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Kondo. Um, um, for your uh, overview of, uh, of the response. So, um, so with many thanks, I, it's now, it pleases me now to introduce and welcome um, Craig Spencer. Dr. Craig Spencer is an Associate Professor uh, of Practice um, of Health Services Policy and Practice at Brown University School of Public Health. His experience includes working on the front lines uh, of the Ebola outbreak in West Africa and advocating for innovative solutions to public health uh, challenges. With his background in both practice in academia, uh, Dr. Spencer brings a unique perspective to our discussions today. Thank you very much, Craig. Um, over to you. Thank you so much, Wilma, and thank you, uh, Dr. Makumbi and Dr. Chundo, for your remarks. I'll try to build on what has already been shared from the perspective of a healthcare provider. And in terms of clinical care, there are five really big, I think, things we need to prepare for, but also takeaways when we're thinking about how we respond to a viral hemorrhagic fever outbreak, whether it's Ebola or Marburg. Um, I'm going to list them quickly and then quickly go through them. Number one, keeping staff safe. Number two, supportive care. Number three, higher level of care. Number four is treatments. And number five is your follow-up process. So let's start with number one. When we think about caring for patients, often we forget about the people caring for patients. And in the middle of outbreaks or at the beginning of outbreaks, Ebola, COVID, Marburg, um, your number one goal needs to be keeping your staff safe. This is true in Rwanda, as in every other VHF outbreak, it is the most important. Why? Look back a decade ago in West Africa, we know that between six to eight percent of healthcare providers in Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone um, were killed um, by Ebola during that outbreak. A, a massive number, especially in a place where healthcare providers are already too few. If you can't protect your staff, 
especially early on, you're going to lose morale. It's going to be much harder to care for patients. And many of your most loved providers will become patients, which is really, really difficult for um, the providers who, who are left to take care of their friends and colleagues. Now, it's not just making sure you have enough personal protective equipment, although that's really important. It's not just making sure that you have uh, proper protocols for how you put on and how you take off that equipment. Again, that's also really important. There are also other things that you do to keep your staff safe. This includes the rapid deployment of protocols for making sure anyone coming into the hospital seeking care um, is triage. And you ask whether they have a fever, whether they've been having any symptoms consistent with what may be Marburg in this case, whether they may have any possible contacts. And although this sounds really, really easy, have someone at the door, check temperatures, um, it's actually really hard to do because you're doing this at many hospitals, many clinics, at many providers, and it's often easy for people to slip through. And I think about this in 2015, so a year after the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, I was working as an epidemiologist um, for Doctors Without Borders in Conakry, the capital in Guinea, and we were alerted of a case that was being treated, had received dialysis and many other, you know, higher level care invent interventions on the floor of the hospital. Um, and only about a week after they had come in and gotten really sick, did someone think about uh, testing them for Ebola, despite the fact that the hospital itself was wrapped around our Ebola treatment center. It's going to be really, really difficult. So number one, keeping staff safe. Number two, supportive care. To drive down mortality in Ebola or Marburg, you don't need a lot of fancy things. And I think that Rwanda has shown that even if you're not spending $4.3 trillion on health like we are in the US, with basic interventions, you can drop down the mortality range from something that's quoted as high as you know 22 to 88%, down to like 22 to 23%. Um, in West Africa during Ebola, we saw mortality somewhere between 40 to 60%. But here in the United States, only two of the people um, that were infected with Ebola and treated for Ebola in the U.S., two of the 11, only two died. And it just goes to show that with basic intervention, symptomatic management, providing IV fluid, um, some of the things that you know, we can do to keep staff safe, but also to provide basic care to, provi uh, to, to patients can be dramatically helpful in outbreaks like this. All right, so keeping staff safe. Supportive care, the third thing is higher level of care. When it comes to things like Ebola and Marburg, often we don't have access to things like hemodialysis and life support because many times these outbreaks occur in rural areas. They may occur in places where the healthcare infrastructure is not particularly strong. What we saw here over the past you know, month plus is that in a place like Kigali, where healthcare infrastructure has been dramatically strengthened in the past couple of decades, you have wonderful emergency medicine care, you have great ICU care, and that has been built on a lot of in-country training as well as a lot of partnerships with people and groups around the world. And the result was that for the first time, um, Marburg patients were able to be taken off life, life support um, on the African continent, the first time ever. So that means there are two more people alive today that under circumstances in other places may not be. The fourth thing is treatments. We know that Ebola has two FDA approved uh, monoclonal antibody treatments, which is wonderful. Marburg has no FDA approved treatments. There are investigational treatments that were brought into uh, Rwanda in really unprecedented uh, speed. Um, we also know that remdesivir was being used, um, particularly for post-exposure prophylaxis for healthcare providers and others. And we don't know what impact the monoclonals are having on patient survival in Rwanda. We'll hopefully get some more of that information. But the fact that we were able as an international community to get them in so quickly, I can tell you from talking to friends on the ground, um, some of whom were providing those medications to their colleagues, um, it meant an incredible amount um, in terms of global solidarity. Now, the last thing that I wanna talk about quickly is Follow up for survivors. Now, you may not think about this as a big part of clinical care. We often think about we get to get people to discharge and they get home where they can convalesce. 
But we know for viral hemorrhagic fevers, you may have months, if not years of lingering symptoms. And it may be things like headaches and joint pain, but often what it can be is stigma and other social issues as well as physical issues. Um, I know that Rwanda has already started putting in place programs to support survivors in that period after um, they're lucky enough to survive this disease. This will be one of the most important components for success going forward. So one thing that I just wanna, in my last few seconds, focus on is really the unprecedented nature of the response to this outbreak, as has already been pointed out by our two other panelists. We saw from the time that this outbreak was declared on September 27th to the time that investigational vaccines and treatments were brought in country just eight days later and almost immediately being offered to frontline providers, the vaccines as a you know preventative measure and to patients as treatment. In the span of just over a week, we had these medical countermeasures brought in country. And this is, is incredible. Um, and I refuse uh, to use the word unprecedented uh, very often, uh, but I think in this scenario, it, it is. And it shows what is actually possible um, when we focus on global equity and global solidarity, especially in response to things like this. But it also shows that we need to do better and we need to do better in many other circumstances. And I think that there are ways that we can get there and a lot of the lessons of what we've learned over the past month will hopefully get us there. So I'll stop here and pass it back to you, Uma. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much um, to Dr. Spencer. So um, just to thank again, uh, uh, Dr. Makumbe, Dr. Chundo, uh, and Dr. Spencer for their uh, um, navigation through all the complexities of what has uh, turned out to be a demonstration uh, of what ought to happen uh, in terms of rapid response. So, so many, many thanks. Um, and as we know, um, the whole purpose uh, of uh, preparing for pandemics and for infectious disease outbreaks with epidemic and pandemic potential is, uh, is simply better preparedness given the experience that we've had. Um, starting off with early detection uh, and starting surveillance and with uh, a rapid uh, di diagnostic capacities using the technologies that we have. So uh, I'd like to ask uh, a question uh, as, as the moderator uh, put it to all the panelists, um, perhaps starting with you, uh, Dr. Uh, Chunda, uh, uh, to ask what made it possible and what were the problems with early detection uh, surveillance um, given the fact that the symptoms uh, uh, of Marburg are often uh, confused with those uh, of, uh, of malaria. And of course, Ebola is also a, a part of the Marburg family. So, um, so early diagnosis requires um, a, a level of diagnostic uh, sophistication in order to make early detection possible. Uh, and so if you can just reflect on what this experience has taught us uh, about how you prime your early detection system and what the remaining challenges are still in even improving on that. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. James. Um, I think you, you pointed right there. I think the lesson learned and what we are still looking for is um, number one is the lab, the lab capabilities and capacity to detect early now. Number two, at the same level is also healthcare providers, especially those at the front. I'd like to pause here and to thank all my colleagues who are working in the treatment center, who've been working so hard, uh, regardless of the risks and, and, and also to support the colleagues. And also to recognize the, all the efforts of the government from the top level down there to the ministry, to the local government and so forth. I think that coordinated support to support uh, from all over the, the countries, including multilateral, regional, international organizations who came all together to support. So the first two days, I think, was to number one, to see, you know, what, where else did you see the cases, how the cases present themselves, triggering all the response teams, get everyone on board, 
and Africa CDC, WHO, and all local organizations, CDC, they all came together and support in terms of genetics and personal genetic workers. Um, the doctors as well, you know, put all the things together to make sure that uh, the treatments, the, the management, and, and all the requirements for prevention, detection, surveillance, monitoring, case management are uh, also uh, in place. Activate quickly a treatment center that will help following up closely with the patient with 24 hours uh, surveillance system. So I think that's what's happened, uh, you know, during the first couple of days uh, until now. We're, we're still at the, at the center, bio center, where all patients are being uh, managed. My recommendation is, again, uh, as my colleague said, uh, Dr. Issa, it's not only is coordination, alignment, leadership. We need to three together. Number two is to know that um, the way that our traditional way of teaching probably doesn't respond anymore to uh, the, the issues that we are seeing today uh, in terms of public health threats uh, is to equip our students, our future doctors, but also those who are already there uh, with everything that they need in terms of simulation centers, in terms of uh, activating even countries with no outbreak at all, but at risk bring all of them together, work together, equip them with skills, knowledge, tools that they need to make sure that they can detect quickly and they can respond quickly. So I think that probably my second paper that is coming out is to see how not only where countries have already declared the outbreak, but also countries that are going to have outbreak because of the facility, because of the almost the same uh, environment that this type of disease or any other type of disease will, will, will come. So my response to you, Dr. James, is to really activate all the frontline healthcare providers together, give them courses that they need to be able to detect early enough and to manage early enough, equip all the lab regardless with BSL-4, uh, even plus uh, equipment that can detect quickly, that can prevent, that can uh, support all of them. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much, Dr. Chundo. Um, I want to turn to uh, Dr. Makumbi and and, yeah. and for his response. I wanted to supplement. I wanted to supplement uh, that uh, submission. Uh, in please. that, uh, yeah. uh, in in that, really, um, I don't know. We we need to have a mindset, uh, especially looking at focusing on preparedness. You cannot build a lab when there is an emergency. So you need to prepare before time and be ready. And what I've learned, the lesson I've learned, that developing this capacity takes time. And also we need to focus on development. But most of our, uh, you know, our leaders, our partners, uh, they don't take preparedness as something which is good investment, smart investment. When there is an outbreak, you see everybody running to come. But we missed the bus. This is too late. But now that when there is capacity built, you can see the results. You saw the results when Uganda controlled the border in 69 days. Now we are seeing Rwanda doing wonders because of the capacity we built before, before these uh, uh, outbreaks come. So really to me, I think we should change our set mind that really we should focus on preparedness so that we are ready. As long as we are living with these germs, there is no way we can cope apart from being ready and preparing for them and have the capacity to really uh, put a, a control them or, or so that our people don't lose lives. So to me, this is what I think. These are some of the lessons we are learning that capacity will never be uh, a wrong investment. It's a smart investment, preparedness. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Makumbi. Uh, Isa, just to say that, um, colleagues, you will know there are two uh, ways of assessing the gaps in preparedness uh, and response. Um, one is the joint external evaluations as run by the WHO. And in fact, Dr. McCumbie was one of the founders of that initiative. He led 
the assessment of the United States in the 19 in, in the 2010s. Um, the other measure is a global health security index, uh, which also assesses gaps in systems. Um, and what Dr. McCumbi has said is that preparedness requires filling those gaps. Um, now, preparedness is, as we know, a paradox. So when you invest in preparedness, nothing happens. That is, success is the lack, the containment of an outbreak, or nipping it in its bud. And so it's been very hard often to persuade uh, uh, investors to put money in preparedness uh, when nothing happens, okay, which is a success. And so, and this is a demonstration of the value of investing in preparedness. Uh, and we've got existing metrics uh, provided by the JE and the Global Health Security Index to in fact sketch out what the gaps are uh, in terms of lab systems, surveillance systems that need to be filled. So I want to turn uh, to Craig uh, Spencer also to uh, just give his comments as well. Um, I'm sorry, specific comments on, on which part? On the issue of um, effective surveillance systems, mm. early detection, early diagnosis in a yeah. way that Rwanda just demonstrated so that yeah. action in terms of response can be rapid. Absolutely. So I was in an event last night um, focused on, on this issue on global equity and uh, pandemic tools. And Joya Mukherjee from Partners in Health um, had a great point about pathogens only being part of a pandemic. Um, the bigger part might be the strength of you know community uh, relationships, um, the existence of equity, but also strong health systems. And we know that surveillance in terms of picking up these outbreaks is absolutely fundamental. What we saw here in Rwanda was from the time of an index case from the, to the time that this was picked up to this was reported was a span of just a few weeks, as opposed to in West Africa, in Guinea in 2014, it was a span of like three to four months between the first case and the eventual kind of recognition and declaration of that outbreak. Now, weeks to months may not sound like a massive difference, but in terms of how much harder it makes to get an outbreak under control, it is um, absolutely um, fundamental that we're able to deck these things as quickly as possible. This is particularly true as something that I know you're very passionate about, Wilma, is you know the, the focus on One Health and the reality that we now have human populations in much closer contact um, with many of these potential reservoirs, whether they're bats or primates or whatever um, the animal or um, source may be in terms of um, novel or potentially emerging outbreaks. Um, we know that around the world, many countries have over the past four to five years, increased their capacity to detect um, you know, viruses, a lot of the technology that was built up during COVID, um, as well as other public health emergencies, including MPOX, means that many places are more ready than they were, but we still have a lot of work to make sure all places are as ready as they need to be. Um, I particularly, you know, think about Rwanda's capacity um, with respect to the region, you have Uganda, which has done this, has done Marburg and Ebola and many other things over the past um, few decades. Um, but you have places like Burundi where the healthcare infrastructure is not as strong as it is just to the north. Or in DR Congo, particularly in the east, where you have still ongoing conflict, as well as many other health challenges that are going to make this surveillance, this detection, and this response work considerably harder. So thank you very much, uh, Craig. So, um, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, there's a question um, in the chat being asked about uh, the transfer of treatments. So these would be therapies uh, uh, on the one hand um, and, uh, and uh, vaccines on the other. Um, and the question um, being posed is what partnerships or programs enabled the rapid transfer of both? Um, we've heard they required global partnership cooperation, 
uh, that had to be stitched together very quickly in order to enable that to create that kind of platform. So just to ask the question again, starting with uh, Dr. Chundo, um, what partnerships enabled and programs enabled the transfer of both uh, the treatments and the vaccines um, un understood as investigational at this point? Thank you so much. Uh, as uh, it was communicated um, by the WHO Director General, but also with our Minister of Health. In fact, I was just uh, listening to an audio uh, that uh, that uh, James referred to me with Dr. Saban, the Minister of Health. I think it's very inspirational the way, um, first of all, the, the systems were put in place quickly, not only in terms of prevention and, and case management, but also in terms of science. As we said at the beginning, Rwanda is a country where data and policy decisions all working together. So it was understanding that it was uh, very, very smooth and swift to see that all the NHR, you know, national health uh, regulators in country were all put in place, activated and be ready to support in innovation, to support in science for the, the you know, to have the best outcome of our patients. So just uh, as I said, um, the, the Minister of Health communicated a couple of weeks ago uh, about the trial that Rwanda is doing in terms of the vaccine, but also in terms of uh, uh, the treatment. So both trials are happening in Rwanda currently, and uh, they are they're running, and uh, we are not yet, uh, still, uh, Rwanda is still a rolling patient. So that's all what we know so far. But uh, one is very open to see anything that can happen to support the evidence so that the policies are based on evidence. So that was communicated both by the Director General of uh, WHO, uh, Dr. Tedros, as well as the Minister of Health. You know, putting all this together is also part of the steps that we talked about in our paper, uh, in our commentary in terms of how do you move from preparedness to uh, management, detection, and management and surveillance, but also how do you communicate to the people around you? Two types of communication. Number one is the population, your patients. You need to, to have a way of communicating to the community, and that's what the ministers are yeah. doing from day one, informing the, the community what we are doing, uh, what are the steps, what are the cases, what, what are the numbers, but also to inform them in terms of uh, vaccines that we receive from um, Sabine uh, that were also uh, supporting in terms of protecting, especially the the care healthcare providers, as well as those working in the mines. And number two is also to, to check anything that can come out to support in terms of uh, a treatment. So those are the two trials that are happening uh, in Rwanda, but it's not only making those happen, but also making all the systems together to support any innovation in science uh, moving forward. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chundo. Um, Dr. Spencer? Yeah, thank you. Um, just to follow up on her comments. So the, the vaccines that have made their way into Rwanda in record time um, were donated by the Sabin Institute, which is a nonprofit, which is working on vaccines for things exactly like this. Um, Marburg, Ebola, Sudan, um, very high consequence pathogens that still aren't getting the investment and the support, the more broad support that they need in terms of development and, um, and access. And so I'm grateful for the Sabin Institute, um, but I'm a bit, I guess, concerned and perplexed despite, you know, having decades of experience knowing what impact these pathogens can have that we don't have more of a kind of full speed um, preparedness and response for responding in developing these tools. And we've seen how helpful they've been here in Rwanda, which is great. Um, one of my best friends and colleagues was vaccinated in, in just the first few days that those vaccines made it in country in Rwanda. But I think about the fact that despite having two FDA approved um, treatments for Ebola, 
in the last five Ebola outbreaks, during which we've had FDA-approved treatments, only about a third of all Ebola patients have received access to those. So creating these tools, having them, investing in them, trialing them is really, really, really important. But if we cannot ensure access, equitable access to these tools, to the people that need them, then the question is, what value do they really have? And so we have not dramatically lowered the, the, you know, the, the risk of mortality, um, the mortality rate amongst Ebola um, patients over the past decade. The things that we've done have been, you know, preventing cases with vaccines, great. Have been providing that basic and supportive care, great. But we could lower it even further if we're able to expand access and part of the issue is that for tools like these, they may be held like Ebola treatments in a U.S. stockpile as part of you know, biodefense. They may continue to be owned by pharmaceutical companies who have the regulatory data and you know, who need to be propositioned to get them in country at a right time. And unlike what we saw in the seven to eight days of getting monoclonals and vaccines into Rwanda, that process for things like Ebola treatments takes considerably longer, and we need to change that process if we want to make best use of those tools that we've developed. Thanks, Wilma. So you raise a fundamental point, and to be very direct, um, uh, it is to say that what's required is um, more volume, scaling up, and better access. Um, and if we don't do that, when we have the therapies and we have the science-based solutions to saving lives, the failure is not a technical failure. The failure actually is a moral one. And so I think I can't emphasize enough the point that Dr. Spencer is making, that we really need to do a lot better on this front when it comes to equity. And everybody involved in this, the partnerships, the national governments, the national ministries of health, the regional partners and the global partners, uh, including the financing and funding agencies really need to scale up. Just, I want to underscore that as one fundamental lesson uh, in terms of how we dealt with the issue uh, of Marburg in uh, Rwanda. So uh, um, colleagues, there's a further question. Um, um, Dr. Trindo, did you wanna comment? Yeah, I wanna, I wanna just again emphasize on what you and Craig said on uh, moral uh, responsibility, but also I think in country uh, leadership, it's it's really really key understanding that and and making sure that you plan everything ahead of time. How do you you know questions came? How do you deal with uh, vaccine hesitancy? How do you deal with you know all those questions? It's just this uh, communication, public communication making sure that you inform your population ahead of time, they're all prepared. And number two is also uh, making sure that once we have those tools, those treatments in place, things will continue uh, moving smoothly. So I think it's an important responsibility, but also global responsibility for the equity. Over to you. There's a further question in the chat about um genomic epidemiology um, and genomic studies um, and uh, the, the making available of uh, sequences in order to prime better response. And so, and the question, I, the last question I'd like to put to the panel from, uh, from uh, the audience um, it goes as follows. Uh, it's really uh, put uh, to Dr. Chundu in the first place, but what is the current status of genomic epidemiology in Rwanda, and what are the priorities of genomic technologies for outbreak preparedness and response moving forward? So uh, Dr. Chundo, and I'd like to turn to the other panelists as well on this question. Thank you so much. Uh, in fact, I was also, I'm also privileged to be part of the SAG. SAG is Scientific Advisory Group uh, that the Minister of Health put in place in terms of uh, supporting the science uh, and, and then also moving any recommendation from the science based on the science. So today we, we discussed about the genomic, genomic aspect. My actual colleague, um, Professor Leon Mutesa, he just got uh, his paper published. Guys, if you have time, 
go to BMJ, you see a paper uh, on today actually uh, published, which is still under um, under the preprint, but you have access to it. Please read and you see the different sequencing results that we're able to get there. So I'm not the expert in that, uh, but if you read, you'll find all the answers that you, 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 you want and on the paper. So we can share the link also. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Spencer, did you want to comment on that? I will only, you know, as a clinician and not a virologist, and only sometimes I'm an epidemiologist, I would come in to say that um, I don't have a whole lot to add on genomic epidemiology itself. But what I do want to point out are two things. One is that we have just had released, you know, a list of, um, you know, the, the pathogens that we should be maybe most focused on and most concerned about when it comes to kind of preparedness and response. Um, and it's absolutely essential that we have, you know, a further strengthening and buildup of capacity in countries, Rwanda, Burundi, Congo, the U.S., et cetera, to be able to detect and respond to those, but also have in place kind of those agreements and that preparedness. Um, the other thing that I think is really important when we think about epidemiology more broadly is that what we've seen over the past month in Rwanda is incredible success by doing the basics and by doing the basics well. They've also done, you know, above and beyond with great preparedness, with great leadership, et cetera. But the basics, contact tracing, um, putting in place surveillance systems at hospitals, things that are really low tech and low cost um, and don't require, you know, centers for genomic excellence, et cetera. Um, we know that we can do a good chunk of the work that needs to be done to respond to and to you know effectively manage outbreaks with the stuff that we know really really works and that is just really good shoe leather epidemiology so i want to um i think genomic epi i think the role of ai in terms of you know um detection and response and preparedness are incredibly important but we've seen here with marburg that like just regular regular epi can be really really impactful um when we're thinking about how we respond to those outbreaks thank you so thank you, uh, Craig. Uh, just to say, uh, colleagues um, and ladies and gentlemen, um, it's um, an occasion for more extended discussion some other time, but how one improves and scales up and makes more precise the surveillance system uh, that exists and the use of digital technologies and digital platforms um, and the use of AI to accelerate that is a huge opportunity to, in fact, uh, um, uh, speed up both diagnostics and surveillance and therefore response. And so you would know that um, there's something called the 717 Alliance, which Dr. Makumbi, in fact, leads, where the goal is to, um, to detect uh, an outbreak within seven days or less to report an outbreak within one day and to uh, respond to that, or at least prepare for the response um, in seven days. So these are the norms that are being set. They've been adopted uh, in a variety of places. And what we can do is not only meet those norms, but in fact, shorten the time. And if we did that, we can stop. We are, would be capable of stopping um, an outbreak uh, in its track. So, I want to give uh, Dr. Makumi just uh, a minute for a, a final a final word from uh, his side, and if you can speak also to the issue that has been raised here about the fundamental importance of leadership. Um, leadership does make the world go round, and if leaders understand what is required, it makes a massive difference, as we've can uh, we've been shown, not only in Rwanda but elsewhere in the world as well. So um, just over to you, um, Issa. So I cannot agree in, in a more on that because really leadership plays a very critical role uh, because uh, as you've said it before, I have evaluated a number of countries on their security uh, you know, scores, very high scores. But when COVID came, I was disappointed. I was disappointed. And what disappointed me actually, it came down to be leadership. So if the leadership really is not correct, we, we have problem. Even if you have all the technical know-how, 
uh, the leadership can fail you. So I cannot agree anymore about that, that the leadership is very critical. And this again, this is something again we need to build. We need to uh, uh, converse with our leaders so that they have that leadership skill in case of uh, these, these problems or these emergencies. Uh, one of the things which also I think which is very important, I agree with Greg that really the basics do wonders. The Gino you, know, uh, you talked about, yes, this should not be routine, but it can be one off or two off because it can help us to uh, develop, you know, countermeasures. However, my problem is that the time lead is so long. For example, Mabaga has been here since 19, 1989. And up to now, there is no approved vaccine. And again, this comes to investment, you know, investment. I think we must divine, I mean, design a, an investment where there are incentives for those big uh, pharmaceuticals to really give them incentive to really put these products uh, available. Otherwise, uh, I think if they put it on the market, nobody is going to pay for them, but we must really design an incentive, a financing incentive, so that these products are on the market. Like things like really Marburg, these which are very high consequence pathogens. Really, we can't wait. I know CEPI is trying the 100 days, but still, again, we don't see the movement. I know they are working on you know, many others. Of course, it takes time. But I think, really, we should devise ways of really uh, designing how we can motivate or incentivize these big companies which have the capability to really uh, put these products and countermeasures uh, available. And as you said, the, the equity issues also can be applied later on. But at least if the products are really available. On one seven, uh, on seven one seven, I think this is really a Dr. very Dr. yes. If you can, if you can just wrap, um, we're heading towards closure. Oh, okay. I think then maybe I just let me just wrap up. But and I agree with you that seven one seven really uh, is a thermometer to test our system, the whole response system, uh, to tell you whether where it is not working, where it is broken, and where it's doing wonders. I, I submit. Thank you very much, um, Issa. So, uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, we uh, before we close, I wanted to say that um, the the host to uh, the Marburg uh, virus is a particular species of bat, uh, and bats clearly um, are being affected in terms of their habitats, in terms of migration patterns, and in terms of um, the contact with humans and an increasing scale. Um, in the case of Rwanda, it was es essentially bats inhabiting caves in, in areas uh, where there's ongoing mining, and that's what part is disturbed the bats. So, so climate matters here. We need to study the bat ecology uh, more closely and see how we can, in fact, uh, develop effective strategies to deal with, with this increasing contact by adopting a One Health approach. Just to note that um, uh, there are shifts undergoing in bat habitats and ranges. Uh, there are disrupted hibernation and breeding patterns, uh, and also extreme weather events uh, impact on both um, uh, the migration patterns uh, and, uh, and the exposure uh, of human beings um, uh, under those circumstances. So further studies uh, need to be undertaken in that particular area. I'd like to close uh, with a hearty thank you to Drs. Uh, Chundo, Makumbi, and Spencer, and to everybody else who has joined us today for such a productive, timely, and robust discussion. Also, thank you to the Pandemic Center, who helped to put this event together, to Bentley Holt, uh, Michael Mitchell, uh, Leah Lovgren, Amanda Kogan, Carly Gaska, uh, Andy Ulig, uh, Anne Wang, and Alice M. Finally, if you would like to share this event with anyone who was, who was unable to attend, the recording will be posted uh, on the events page um, of our website uh, next week. Uh, you can also find recordings of all previous webinars there. Please follow us uh, on our social media accounts to learn about all of our events and future webinars. Please reach out 
to the email address with any questions or suggestions for future webinars in our Pandemics and Society series. To note that uh, many of our colleagues mentioned publications uh, and references, um, and we will do our best to put those resources together so you can get access to that. So, uh, and finally, just to thank everybody, uh, we are adjourned. Please be safe, be healthy, and do stay engaged uh, with many thanks. Bye-bye. Uh, thank you, Prof, for coordinating this, for moderating this very well. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.